Thursday, November 3rd. I uh, want to uh, thank everyone for joining us for the November 3rd Land Use and Natural Resources Committee. Uh, will everybody please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? Again. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. See, once, once we're all back in the room together, it won't sound like a Sorry. Bill Collins or, you know, the big sound, big wall of sound with the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, Robert, any housekeeping items? Yeah, a few housekeeping items before we start. Good afternoon, everyone. This meeting is being recorded and streamed over the internet. For members of the public, we accept and encourage public comment and have provided options that are listed at the top of this meeting agenda. For our committee members attending in person today, thank you for coming. Uh, please note that you have a table microphone in front of you. Don't pick up or move the table mics as will result in feedback. You can speak at a normal volume and the mics will transmit the audio through Zoom. Uh, green means you are live, red means you are muted. For our committee members participating online, thank you for joining us today. Please mute your devices when you're not speaking and use the raise hand feature in Zoom to comment. Would you like me to go to roll call? Uh, yes, please. All right. All right, directors, when I call your name, please indicate your presence. Uh, Director Bullahan. Here. Frost. Absent. Gialdo. Here. Gore. Here. Harris. Absent. Kennedy. Absent. New. Here. West. Here. Vice Chair Baines. Present. Vice Chair Clark Kretz. Here. And Chair Sargosa. Here. We have a quorum. All right. Thank you. And do we have any public communications? Uh, there are no public comments at this time. All right, then we will go ahead and move on to the consent calendar. Any questions on the consent calendar? Seeing none, uh, do we have any public comments on the consent calendar? Uh, there's no public comment. All right, thank you. Uh, do we have a motion on consent? New moves, new moves for approval. Thank New West seconds. All right, we have a first and a second. We see no further comments. Uh, roll call, please. All right. Uh, Director Bullahan. Um, aye. Uh, Frost. Absent. Gallardo. Aye. Gore. Aye. Harris. Absent. Kennedy. Absent. New. Aye. West. Aye. Vice Chair Baines. Aye. Vice Chair Clark Kretz. Yes. And Chair Saragosa. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, moving along, uh, we're going to go to our uh, one action item. That's item number four. Uh, green means go. Funding recommendations in the early activation category. And uh, Garrett has this uh, item for us this afternoon. Thank you, Garrett. Great. Thank you, Chair. It's my pleasure on the behalf of the larger Green Means Go team to be before you for the recommendations, the first ever Green Means Go funding program. So it's a testament to a lot of hard work this year. Also a testament to the foundation, this board, and many others in the regional aid of getting that Green Means Go funding into the region. So what we're talking about today is called the early activation category. It's about $3 million in funding. It's the smallest category. And just for context, um, the, the categories planning and capital. So the second and third category is about 10 times larger. We're just due to say Cogdell's applications um, late, late last week. So the committee, this committee and the board will be seeing those funding recommendations early next year. So we're talking today about the, the first part of Green Means Go, 3 million of the over 34 million available. And we've called that early activation. The item before you is an action item. And there's three components of that. The first is uh, to approve the updated budget for this category. I'll come back to that in a second. The second is for this committee to recommend the board approve the, the scope and funding amounts for the projects. And then the third is to uh, uh, delegate authority to the executive director to execute any agreements. And also, if, if there is any, to res, um, program any residual value um, left over. We don't plan on that. Obviously, this is a fully um, funded staff recommendation, but just in case there is. So let's go back to the first part of that recommendation, the budget. This early activation category, we originally had put a budget forward of $3 million. This is funded through a larger grant that SACOG received from the Strategic Growth Council. And that includes many tasks, one of which is these funding awards, but, but many other tasks around uh, executing on our sustainable community strategy and standing up Green Means Go, which is a brand new program. So about a year into Green Means Go, we, we took stock of, of where we're at as with some of the tasks we laid out in that grant. 
And we were also able to move a little bit of, of um, funding forward from another program, which is called REAP-1, to, to, to pay for some of the technical assistance we're doing in this, in this program, which freed up a little bit of money. So that's why you see the staff recommendation before you today is for $3.2 million in funding awards. The original estimate was $3 million. So I just want to call attention to that, that difference between the original estimate and the staff report gives a little bit more reason to the, um, the, the increase in the staff recommendation. Um, of course, you know, even with this, this little bit extra revenue, the program's still oversubscribed, like many funding programs. And um, I think the important point to emphasize is we went through a pre-application phase with talking with any interested applicant and sponsor. All of the projects that came forward are exhibiting, you know, strong, you know, alignment with Green Means Go, but of course there's not enough money to fund all of them. So the reasoning behind the staff recommendation is laid out in the staff report. And in particular, attachment B lays out project by project, the summary of the review criteria in the working group and where they landed. And, and I should say those criteria were, were laid out in the guidelines for Green Means Go, which the board adopted earlier this year. So of course, um, you know, not enough money to fund them all. And we very much recognize the projects aren't getting recommended for funding, the disappointment there, but we feel like uh, the staff recommendation before you is alignment with those criteria laid out in the guidelines. So with that, uh, we would recommend that this committee move this item to the full board with the 3.2 million in funding awards. And that concludes my presentation. Happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Gary. Any questions at this point? Uh, for the, I have a, a question. Chair Sarah Garcia and oh, Dr. Yes. Director Gore, their hand up. Oh, yes. Sorry, Bonnie. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the report and I had a chance to read through the item. So thank you. Um, shoot, what was my question? Um, the question is these, these projects had to be completed within a certain period of time, correct? So within two years, is that correct, Garrett? Yeah, absolutely, Director Gore. And that was one of the distinctions between this category, the early activation really emphasis on early, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is a blend of planning and capital, so some planning and also infrastructure, but, but the key point is there's a really near-term time frame. So that, mm -hmm. that helped dictate what projects came forward in this category. So you'll see in the other two categories, the planning and capital categories, mm -hmm. right, a longer time frame till 2026. Um, sounds like a longer way, but with infrastructure, there's you know still a need to be moving forward on those. But I think where you're driving at with your question, Director Gore, is um, that timeline of really needing these funds out the door and spent also dictated what project came forward in this category. Yes, that was actually the purpose of my question where I was headed. So thank you. I, I appreciate it. I mean, it's really great to see uh, a number of cities apply. And really, um, actually, every city that applied got something. Um, Whereas the city of Sacramento, Sacramento County, or you know, have a joint project, so this is really good to see. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Director Gore. Uh, my question was just for, uh, <coughs> excuse me, for the uh, the projects that didn't get funding. Do we know did they reapply in the next in that second round? So of the three that did not, are they not part of the staff recommendation, one did elect to move forward the Broadway project in the city of Sacramento. The other two did not. And, and part of that has to do with in the pre-application phase, like we talk about the projects and where they fit. This category, the early activation category, is sort of a microcosm of those two cate other categories, but there are some differences. So, so Broadway was the one that um, the sponsor felt had the best fit of moving forward. So that project will be part of um, the review of, of the larger, capital, larger category called capital. Understood. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, comments? All right. Seeing none. Is anyone prepared to make a motion through the chair? Yes. Move to approve. Thank you. Clerk, Clerk Critch seconds. Thank you. Uh, yes. Or Pierre, did you have a question, or were you just going to move move the item? Just moving out. Okay. All right. Great. We have a first and a second. Uh, do we have any other former comments? Being none, uh, roll call, please. Sure. And for the record, no public comment on this item. Um, Director Thank you, Mike Carney, please indicate your vote. Director Bullahan? Um, aye. Frost? Absent? Gialdo? Aye. Gore? Aye. Harris? Yes. Kennedy? Absent? New? Aye. West? Aye. Vice Chair Baines? Aye. Vice Chair Clark Kretz? Yes. And Chair Saragosa. Yes. Motion carries. All right. Chair Thank Saragosa, you. Chair Saragosa, do you mind if I just, I just want to, um, I know everybody knows this, I think, but if you all as elected officials and SACOG board members and your peers 
and lots of other folks didn't really work hard the last three years in the legislature, we wouldn't have an item in front of you today. So I just want to, I, you know, I know it's a small, relatively speaking, small thing, but as Director Gorgeous said, really nice to see the regional diversity and the projects coming forward. We'll obviously have more of that, as Garrett mentioned, in the next, the larger cycle. This was the money and the budget that Senator Pan had really pushed hard for, and he really pushed hard for that because of everything that you all did, uh, the groundwork that we all, you all laid and we all laid. Um, there was a lot of like blood, sweat, and tears. So I just want to just want to take a moment and recognize the hard work that has paid off there. No, thank you, James. I, I was going to just say a couple of words too, which was exactly what, what you just said. Uh, it was a lot of a lot of hard work. Uh, I really want to thank staff for all the work that went into this uh, to put it together and to get these funds out the door. It's great to see uh, that work and then seeing the the fruits of that at the end of the day. So thank you, Garrett and team, uh, for all the work on this item and. Looking forward to seeing, I believe, March for um, the next round of, of things coming out. So or I think we'll all be looking forward to seeing that. Uh, and then hopefully, uh, as our efforts continue, that even though it's a challenging budget year, um, you know, we need to still be out there advocating and being at the table to try to bring home some additional dollars uh, under this program. So thank you again. All right, uh, we're going to move on to our information items, uh, which is item five, and uh, that is the Marysville Green Zones uh, specific planning activities. And Greg uh, has this item this afternoon. Thanks, Greg. Great, thank you. Uh, Greg Chu on the planning staff at SACOG. Um, so periodically, uh, we try to bring forward some um, positive efforts that are going on in the region by our local agencies, uh, just to give inspiration and example. Um, so um, we just talked about the Green Means Go um, program. Uh, its predecessor program is the Regional Early Action Planning Grants uh, that um, SACOG received. And then uh, the vast majority of that money went out to uh, grants to all of our member agencies uh, in the House in the form of housing grants, uh, things that would provide uh, and promote uh, the development of housing. The city of Marysville received a couple of grants, uh, and uh, with us today is Kathy Pease. Uh, she's a um, planning consultant, longtime staff member in Roseville, uh, retired from there, and has been helping our jurisdictions uh, throughout the region. Uh, she's going to describe uh, the city's efforts uh, using these grant monies as well as uh, the city's own funds to revitalize uh, their central community. Uh, core area in Marysville. So with that, uh, Kathy Pease. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm pleased to be here um, to provide an overview of what's going on in the city of Marysville. Let me see if I can start this. Can everyone see that? Yep. Great. Um, so yeah, as Greg said, I am a planning consultant. I'm providing support to the city of Marysville probably familiar, but Marysville is located in Yuba County. It has a population just under 13,000. It's 3.5 square miles. And as you can see, it's almost entirely surrounded by the river. There's a levee that surrounds it because it is in the floodplain. Some of the challenges are that the city of Marysville is economically disadvantaged. A majority of the residents have a low income level. It's landlocked because of those levees that I mentioned. There are two major state highways that bisect the city, both Highway 70 and Highway 20. As a result, um, outside of automobiles, it's kind of a struggle to work on mobility for pedestrians and bicycles with those two freeways going through the site. Um, there are not a lot of opportunities for outward growth. And because of some of the constraints, uh, there's a huge need to try and attract investment and underutilized parcels. And while I don't have it on this slide, because they're a small city, they are very streamlined as far as um, staff support. Most of the departments are one or two people. They are fortunate. It's very unique in that there are a ton of historic resources. There's a federal 
land, uh, historic landmark district, and there are several individual buildings that qualify both at the federal and state level as historic landmarks. With all of that, I think that Marysville is really at a crossroads, thanks to the grants that Greg mentioned. I think there are a lot of huge opportunities right now. So some of the things I'm gonna talk about are the general plan update, whoops, <laughs> excuse me, um, and some of the grants that we received and some of the other things going on. So the grants, they were able to receive a regional early action planning grant to prepare a specific plan on a portion of the city. And we just recently also uh, applied for one of the next Green Means Go grants to look at infrastructure studies on our sewer and our stormwater. If Marysville is successful in getting that grant, uh, that will help provide additional information to the specific plan. Uh, for some reason, my slides are automatically advancing. I'm not quite sure why. Um, so we are doing a general plan update. Uh, it's the first one we've done since 1985. A uh, reason for that is not a lot of staff involvement. So we're leveraging the grants, which are doing, allow us to do some technical studies, and that will help us also update the general plan at the same time. It's a unique opportunity to look at housing and economic development opportunities. And we have a very robust outreach program that we've initiated. We have a general plan advisory committee that's made up of business owners, major employers like Ride Out Hospital and Caltrans, uh, long-term residents and others. We've done uh, three meetings so far to see what those folks want as far as the vision for the future for Marysville, uh, what some constraints that they're concerned about, and also we're delving into alternatives. Uh, as part of that effort, we've also done online surveys to get input. So the grant I mentioned is funding a green zone specific plan. It is looking at several districts, the Ellis Lake, the East Street Corridor, the Downtown Commercial Core, as well as what we call the Medical Arts District, which is surrounding the hospital. So we're excited to see what comes out of that. We're hoping that it will identify catalyst sites uh, that can provide opportunities for infill housing and economic development. Another uh, grant that we've received is going on this week in partnership with the Urban Land Institute. We are doing a workshop tomorrow to look at a city-owned property as shown in the slide. There's four corners. It's city-owned parkland. But as you see, uh, Highway 20 goes right through this. Um, no, it's very underutilized. Folks aren't using the park. So what we'd like to see um, if it's feasible to maybe develop two of the quadrants and then use funds that um, may be uh, raised through that to do improvements to the other two quadrants to actually make them usable park and a public benefit. Um, so there's going to be a tour with ULI tomorrow and then a study that comes out of that. So depending on what the outcome in that effort is, it'll help inform the specific plan. We recently updated our housing element this past year. And one of the things the state had noted is that we really should update the zoning code to be consistent with state law. And we need to identify objective design standards. So we're working on that as well. Oops. <laughs> So uh, one of the things that we're really excited about, uh, the city recently over the last eight months has hired an economic development director, Dan Flores, and he is working with the owner of the Marysville Hotel to look at redeveloping the site for housing. And he's also in talks with Wright Out Hospital to uh, work on an agreement so that a portion of the units uh, can go towards nursing housing. So we'll have workforce housing. So I think this is really exciting um, and we hope to see that move forward in the near future. 
The city owns a five acre property shown in this slide. Uh, they are currently in negotiations with the developer to redevelop the site for a hotel, restaurant, and other mixed uses. And so that should be going to council uh, pretty soon. So that's exciting. And then finally, we have the East Lake Affordable Housing Project. It's 100% affordable. It was approved this past year. It will contain 71 units. And it's the first multifamily project that's been approved in the last 10 to 20 years in Marysville. So uh, amazing thing about this is it was developer driven um, and it will be providing almost half of the city's regional housing needs obligations. So with that, that concludes my presentation. Christina Heredia had hoped to be here this morning. She's the new assistant community development director, but she's out sick. But if folks have questions, uh, her contact's here, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this is great. Now, just listening, is, I, I could just change the word Marysville for Placerville, and it'd be almost identical to the situation that we face and some of the things that we're doing. So it's, it's just it's great to hear all, all the things that Marysville uh, has going on right now. So I'll open it up for questions or comments. Uh, yes, Mr. Harris. Yeah, Kathy, thank you for that presentation. I was curious re regarding Washington Square. Um, which which of the two which two of the four quadrants were they? Are you talking thinking about developing? And in what way? Yes, the east side. Um, so to the right side of that slide that I showed. Um, and we're looking, we're hoping to do affordable or higher density housing and mixed use, so maybe commercial and housing um, on those two quadrants. It's about 2.3 acres, so it's not a huge site, um, but we're hoping to see what comes out of that. All right. Thank you. Uh, yes, Director Gore. Thank you. Um, first of all, Kathy, really nice to see you. Hey, Bonnie. <laughs> Loved working with you. And so I heard your voice. I was like, oh, that's that's wonderful. So she's really good at what she does. And I can tell based on listening to this. And one, I'm just really excited to see that, um, right, we're able to utilize some of these dollars to help smaller jurisdictions actually do some of this planning work. Like, that's really exciting. Um, it's huge. When you see when you see um, a community that hasn't had any multifamily housing in you know decades and decades and and there are underutilized parcels, this is this is terrific. Um, my question for you is about the Marysville Hotel, mm -hmm. um, and I know that it. My understanding, I know enough to be super dangerous, right? Like people <laughs> talked about it on and off for over the years. Um, I love the idea of making it into housing and workforce housing and partnering with the hospital. Um, how likely might that be? I mean, are there dollars where you, is there an interested developer? Um, and if so, like also how, how many units might it provide? Um, I think it could provide up to 60 units, although I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I think that's what I've heard recently. And I think there is huge excitement. The person that owns the property has sat on it a long time. And I think the new economic development director has really lit a flame and met with the property owner and gotten them really excited about the potential. So we are really optimistic that something can actually move forward. And having that partnership with Ride Out Hospital is huge because they would fund a portion of the units and I think that is really a catalyst you know uh, to have that happen so I'm I don't know that we have a lot of specifics but uh, plans are being drawn up and engineering starting to be done so um, we're hopeful that's great thank you thank you uh, yes director Clark Kretz thank you so much I was anticipating this um, presentation so much just because what um, uh, Chair Saragossa said, I can totally see Loomis um, in the same context, and you guys are really leading the way, and it's super exciting to see what's going on in Marysville, and Sean, I'm sure, um, you know, it's exciting too, um, but 
just love the idea that you're refurbishing the hotel. So happy to hear about the workforce housing. I love how you've organized and you're able to have um, so much good going on and just kudos. Thank you for the presentation. It helps small jurisdictions like us to, um, you know, get even more motivated and um, excited to see what's happening with you. And I appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, again, can't thank SACOG enough either. You know, they're very helpful. Um, getting these grants really helps us to leverage other things. So it's amazing. Yeah, no, that was really cool. We, Loomis is in the same boat, basically. We just did our, working on our general plan update as well. And um, so we're sort of tracking along the same way as you. So thank you. That's great. I have a, a question on uh, on your affordable on your housing projects. Did you have to change any of your zoning in order to get the developers to come forward? Just wondering if there was a nexus between the zoning, or it was just a, a good time um, during the economy at that time to to go forward with that project. Yes, it was zoned R three, so it was already um, zoned for that. Um, level of density so that was fortunate and i do think it had to do with the timing of the economy great no it's it's good to good to see that we're kind of the same thing we're tracking a little bit behind marysville we have three affordable housing projects coming forward and we had done some overlay zones several years ago in order to um kind of be put in that position to to do that and then and then just reading you know the, the bisecting by two highways you know, we have Highway 49 and, and Highway 50, so right. we know all, all about that being, <laughs> being bisected and the challenges that, that come with that. So again, thank thank you. And uh, yes, uh, direct, Director New. Uh, I had a question for Kathy as far as the um, working with uh, the hotel. Does, is it a, in the position of needing to be seismic uh, retrofitted as well yes. as just Okay, I was just wondering if that was included in in the uh, problem. So yes, <laughs> we we have we have a couple of buildings in Winters that are in that position. So um, we're having a hard time finding anybody with money enough to do it. That's the absolutely yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Any other questions or comments? All right, seeing none. Kathy, Greg, thank you uh, for the presentation today. I think as you could tell, a lot of us that are from smaller jurisdictions really appreciate uh, the updates and what you're doing and just you know having those ideas out there for us to, to track on as well. And then also from SACOG perspective of seeing those dollars being put to use so that smaller jurisdictions like ours can actually have the extra staff power to, to get things done that you know in a one or two person shop Really might not be able to. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Chair Sargos, I don't know if this was mentioned, but for, uh, I'd step out a sec, but if, for those of you that were over lunch, we had the presentation from the ACE and San Joaquin Rail Commission. Was this already said? So no. No. And no. just the fact that, you know, it's also what's so exciting here, uh, Kathy and, and, and others, is you've got, uh, you got a potential rail extension. With, Mar with downtown Marysville on the map, just as you're doing a specific plan update, right? And I don't know the last time you had, well, daytime passenger rail service there was like 60 years ago. So I do, I'm hopeful that's really a spark as well. I know, Kathy, you're, you've got your sight set on that, but you know, not just station location, but what it means for the downtown, right? And the economic activity and the interest in parcels and our fingers are crossed. We're trying to help on that one too. That's awesome. All right. Well, again, thank you. And we'll look forward to a, a, a more updates as this comes along. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to our next information item, item six. Uh, and this is the Sacramento area zero emission vehicle development strategy. And I know Sam's out today, so Clint will be handling uh, the presentation. Yeah. So thank you. I will do my best to fill in for, for Sam. Um, and we're also joined by um, Rachel Huang from the uh, Sacramento Metropolitan Utility District from SMUD. And I think Kevin Schroeder is here from Sacramento Regional Transit. And then I thought it was gonna be Ray Porter, but I think I might see Jaime Lemus here is, uh, is here from the Sac Metro Air District. Um, so let me jump and forgive me if we're a little clumsy going through the slides. Sam couldn't join today. So I think I'm gonna 
um, kind of call on folks, but uh, as we go, I think Rachel, you're going to kick us off here with the yes. uh, with the first couple of slides. Yep. And then I, I will. will I'll control the uh, the slide deck. So just tell me when you're ready to advance. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Clint, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Rachel Wong, as Clint mentioned. I'm the director of customer grid strategy, and really appreciate all of you having us uh, to talk to you about the work of what we call uh, the four agency collaborative. So that's comprised of SMUD, Zach RT, say, company. Um, you know, what I love is that the four agencies recognized a few years ago the importance of a focused and aligned region to advance the clean mobility and support of improved air quality as well as reducing Hey, Rachel, gas I'm sorry to cut you off, Rachel. I, yep. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm going to say that it, you're kind of going in and out, like fading in and out a little bit. Oh, really? I don't okay. know why that is. Hmm. But if. I'm guessing other board members are having a hard time. Yeah, you might okay. if maybe if you go off off camera, you might get more bandwidth. Could be okay. maybe potentially solve it. Let me let me switch my earphones to you. I'm actually on my you know, but our network at the end is not on this network. Okay. Is that any better? Much better. Maybe not. Okay. Um, uh, no, you're still cutting it out. As I mentioned, the four agencies recognized a few years ago the importance of working together. And so we've actually been meeting um, for the last several years through digital information, collaborating on initiatives, as well as working together to bring. Hey, Rachel, I'm really sorry to do this, but it's still. And we recognize how I'm looking around the room, it's still pretty bad. Goals, including advancing clean resilience climate change as well Ra enabling hey Rachel. Rachel since about a year ago we Rachel. developed a point strategy that brings together our all of our work might not be able to hear us deliver upon these outcomes by reducing vehicle miles travel uh, moving Rachel. to zero emissions fuels as well as investing in energy can you hear me Rachel slides? we're having a we're still having a tough time hearing you um I don't know if we can maybe switch around the the slides to see if we can get Rachel a better better connection. Okay, can you still hear me? No. No, I think we're having an issue. Yeah, we're having a hard better? time hearing you, unfortunately. Rachel, if you're able to, maybe we can have you call in, but I can I can kind of introduce these these first slides and then maybe you can rejoin us if uh, if that works better. Why don't we go ahead and do that, Clint, if, if, yeah. if you so, can. Um, yeah, so Rachel, if you can hear me, well, we'll you'll if you can uh, maybe try to reconnect, I'll introduce these slides and we'll go through and then maybe you can you can join us. Uh, <laughs> Okay. So um, this so this is a, a collaboration we've got with SMUD, Near District, um, and uh, and SAC RT to really look at how we can advance zero emission vehicle technology in the region. Um, and we are looking at four primary strategies for how to do this around transit fleet conversion, medium and heavy duty freight um, vehicles and infrastructure, um, e-mobility hubs. So how do we get electric vehicles um, and electric shared vehicles into um, more disadvantaged communities where they may not be able to afford to purchase, you know, uh, their own their own cars, their own vehicles. And then also to support all of that infrastructure and that investment with a workforce that can be uh, trained up in our region to, to help introduce these technologies and also provide some really great uh, economic opportunities for, for our residents. And um, Kevin Schroeder, if you're there, I think you're gonna you're gonna pick up on this next slide about the transit fleet conversion and refueling infrastructure. I am. Thank you. So Kevin Schroeder, Staff RT Senior Planner. Um, if I do cut out, please let me know. Wave, um, but hopefully you can hear me. Um, so first of all, we just want to say we are really truly appreciative of the partnership and collaboration with the four agencies. Um, it's nice to know that we're all moving in the same alignment towards a zero emission transportation sector. Um, as you know, SACRT is required by the Air Resource Board to be 100% zero emission uh, bus fleet by 2040. 
Um, and by 2030, all buses have to be zero emission that are purchased by us. Currently, right now, we have 240 big buses, so the 40 footers, and 200 cutaway vehicles for ADA and micro transit. Um, if you count the entire six county region with the replacement or conversion, that's going to be 600 buses in the due time uh, as a requirement. Currently, we have 24 zero emission um, big buses, or sorry, 24 emission uh, clean air, sorry, 24 zero emission electric buses. 15 of them are big buses, so the 40 footers, and then nine of them are cutaways. Um, with the support of the four agencies that we've been working with, we've been able to do a zero emission bus rollout plan, which gives us a roadmap for our transition and how we purchase, when we purchase, um, so we can hit those marks set forward. Um, currently, right now, we are looking for facility planning to accommodate our future fleet as our downtown location cannot fit all the infrastructure needed. We're looking in the southern area of Sacramento, um, finding industrial yards and things of that sort. The biggest impact, obviously, is to look at the relocation for maintenance, the garages, the storage of vehicles, and then the costs. And one thing that this group is going to be very helpful with us is looking at the infrastructure upgrades needed for such a big fleet um, move. So with the bipartisan infrastructure bill and historic levels of funding, we find this a great time to really focus in on zero emission transportation. And that's why we're here and excited to move forward with this four agency zero emission plan to uh, better the region. So I'll give it back to you, Clint. Thanks. And, uh, and so I'll, I'll cover this slide on good movement, medium heavy duty. So this is um, the maybe heavy duty trucks, our freight trucks, they're a small amount of the total kind of miles we see traveled on our, on our roadways, around 3% of the overall travel, but they account for a much higher share of total emissions, around 20% of greenhouse gas emissions, over 50% of particulate matter and ozone precursors. So getting them to be able to transition to a more clean future is, is hugely important and a great opportunity. Um, the, we, SACOG recently received a, well, before that, um, SMUD kind of in uh, a few years ago did some, some interviews with fleet managers kind of looking at this chicken and egg issue. Do the, do the vehicles come first or does the infrastructure come first? And public agencies maybe shied away or uh, there hasn't been as much in investment in the infrastructure waiting for the market for vehicles to take off. But there's a lot of hesitation from fleet managers wanting to invest in this technology if they don't know that they can charge or refuel uh, reliably. So um, having a, a public investment in this infrastructure is hugely important. Um, SACOG recently got a grant from Caltrans to work with our mega region partners in the Bay Area and San Joaquin to look at charging infrastructure and refueling infrastructure for, um, this is an important point, particularly for, for those heavier duty vehicles, the electric, electric can be part of the solution, but you don't want to put all your eggs in that basket, right? Hydrogen, other zero emission fuels are hugely important, particularly for that longer haul. So the study that we're looking at is looking for you know, 11 stations through our region, primarily connecting us to the Bay Area um, and, uh, and where, those, where those stations might be located um, and then what it's gonna take to invest in those to get that infrastructure laid uh, so that we can create some more confidence in the technology and see if we can get the market to respond. So um, that there's more to come on, on that grant that we're working on. I think SMUD is also Kind of wrapping up a grant to look at uh, infrastructure needs in Sacramento and West Sacramento. So there's a lot going on in this space right now, and it's a it's a very important part of this of this overall strategy. And then I believe it is Rafe here that can maybe walk us a little bit through these uh, charging and transportation options in um, under-resourced communities. Yeah, uh, thanks, Clint. Uh, good afternoon. I, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I want to echo something uh, Kevin said earlier that this relationship between the four agencies has been fantastic. I think it's gotten us all on the same page and definitely looking forward to um, how we plan um, in this space moving forward. Uh, I think no one understands this issue of mobility better than SACOG and, and this board. So thanks for having us here today to talk about this. Um, why mobility is so important, obviously, you know, you need to get to work, you need to get to school, you need to get to the services that um, we all need to get to. Um, because of, of past planning practices and implementation of, of some of those practices, not everyone has that same um, option or, or mobility um, that, we all, that we all need to get to those services. Um, and so, uh, 
the transition to electric vehicles has often taken that same, um, made that same mistake of, of under-resourcing some of these communities that continue to be under-resourced. So we wanted to take a really deep look at um, where those communities are and, and what is actually needed within those, within those communities. Um, so we're looking at things like electric vehicles and yes, electric vehicles do exist within a lot of these communities. The Air District, for example, has two great programs. We have our community car share and clean cars for all that provide um, access to clean, safe, reliable transportation, such as plug-in and full battery electric vehicles. Um, and there's just more of a market demand for, for these um, types of vehicles. There's also um, car share and ride share opportunities as well as, as e-bike and scooters in, in many of these communities. So what we're looking to do, we've identified 52 mobility hubs throughout the region. And these can be both formal and informal. It's really just a concentration of these mobility solutions in a particular area to again, provide people access and mobility that, that they might not have had in the past. Um, with that, we've identified the need for, for EV chargers installed in these communities as well. Again, there are electric vehicles already in these, whether it's the ride share or car share, there is starting to be a lot of, of ownership of, of plug-in and electric vehicles. So there is an existing need for EV chargers in these communities to be installed. And we're seeing a, a huge increase in that demand. Um, the four agencies has worked together to identify what that demand might be. And we're thinking, or, or on, based on our estimates, we're um, anticipating about 300,000 light duty electric vehicles within the region. So there is gonna be, need to be a, quite a bit of, of charging infrastructure associated with that. So while we have a large focus on the medium and heavy duty side as well, which is definitely important, especially in these, again, in these under-resourced communities where a lot of these operations happen, there is a really big need for on the light duty side as well to, to make sure that we um, provide these mobility options that um, they, they haven't had for some time. So I will turn it back over. I, I think Rachel's back on the line. So I don't know if we wanna give it another shot with her, but she's got the next slide. If not, um, I can probably handle that as well. Okay, can you hear me? Can anyone hear me? Yes, we, we got can. you now. Okay, yes, thank you. Uh, apologies for the technical difficulties. So the last topic um, with regards to the strategy is workforce development. And we know that this transition to a zero emissions future is, is a huge opportunity actually for our region to enable inclusive economic development by training members of our community, particularly those, as Ray mentioned, you know, within our underrepresented and under-resourced communities. And it's gonna be really critical for us to create that pathway for them from the training to the employment um, and, and being able to do so within those high paying clean energy jobs that we'll be creating for the future. This matches really well with the significant need of skilled staffing to support the zero emissions transition. And I think, you know, we're definitely seeing it smut. I think all of our agents are seeing um, those needs for the future. So work is actually already underway with community-based organizations to train members of our underrepresented communities in multiple technology areas. And there's actually been a workforce development program that started in partnership with the California Mobility Center specifically focused on clean mobility jobs. But this strategy area really looks at kind of four key areas, which is one, identifying the jobs that we need and assessing those skills that we need to train for relative to entry-level employment, uh, partnering with those educational institutions, trade organizations, community-based organizations, as well as others to continue to build and expand those training programs relative to the evolving skills that are needed. Um, working with key partners to ensure that the training includes job preparedness, as well as placement and supporting our candidates through those early stages of employment, even after they've received a job, and by ensuring access to wraparound services. So things like childcare, transportation, case management, and more to really ensure that these people are, are, are prepared as they, as they go through these new careers. And then finally, establishing those strong relationships with the trades and employers from the start to make sure that these training programs meet their needs, as well as ensure that those candidates are well prepared for those jobs from the employers themselves. Next slide. So, you know, I think everybody has mentioned this, but, um, you know, I'm going to close at least this part by saying, you know, we started this collaboration between our agencies in recognition that by having a unified voice for our region, that we would be able to better make our shared vision come to fruition. And I've really enjoyed working with, with, with this whole group um, in, in not only developing this, but actually even getting started on a lot of these initiatives as well. Um, and really believe that uh, this effort is really going to prepare us well with regards to attracting funding and resources to help us with our, our regional goals. 
I'm also very excited that these shared efforts are aligned to support delivery to key adjacent efforts like SMUD sustainable communities, resource priorities work, as well as SACOG's Green Means Go initiative. And um, just looking forward to working with this team, um, hopefully that on these initiatives that are gonna be hopefully well-funded by the federal agencies, as well as state funds to move forward our ZEV goals for the region. And, you know, like I said, we're already starting to see some of this coming to fruition. SMUD's been screening grant opportunities um, all year and a lot of them are popping up as, hey, this would be a great opportunity for the Four Agency Collaborative to work on together. Um, so with that, I will hand it back to Clint. So just to kind of close this out, and Rachel got to this a little bit, right now we're kind of in, we've, this, this is a, a brand new document, brand new strategy that um, we published just in the last handful of months. Um, we're now kind of going around and socializing this. We've, we've been presenting to each of our boards um, Rachel mentioned, you know, there's a lot of need for collaboration outside of just these four agencies. And so we're working forward with that, uh, or working together to, to, to move this around the region and make sure everybody is, so everyone who needs to be is aware and engaged in this. Um, and then also, you know, why is this alignment important? But there is a huge amount of money coming and available through the, the Federal Infrastructure Investments Jobs Act. And here's just $1.2 trillion, and here are just some of those programs that are going to be out there um, that we want to just make sure our region is at the table and ready for these for these programs. So this strategy is a is kind of a, a roadmap for how we can be really competitive for these for these funds. So with that, I will I think we can stop sharing the PowerPoint and and uh, we have our panel here for any questions or, or comments from the committee. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. And I'm glad we were able to get you back, Rachel. Um, I know it's two years into the pandemic or plus, but we will continue to have these problems, I think, as we do these hybrid meetings. So thank you for sticking with us here on that. Uh, any questions or comments? I do have one on the workforce development side. You know, it's always been a, I, I, it's always been a, not a, not a complaint, but an irritation to me when I hear sort of the, the green Green new jobs because it's always I've always thought of it as sort of a cheap throwaway line when you talk about real jobs that I know I, I work with a lot of folks uh, carpenters building uh, trades that have jobs that pay over hundred thousand dollars a year uh, in the gas uh, and oil industries that take care of families that they were able to buy houses and, and really uh, contribute to their uh, you know to their neighborhoods and to their regions and so. I'd love to hear more about what those jobs look like and anything that I can do to help move that and, and do that. Cause I do know that there will be a transition, but um, you know, we, we really, I think have to see that in order for this to really, I think make sense uh, for people that are going to be maybe out of whole sectors and what that means to those families and really to those uh, regional economies as well. Yeah. I'll, I'll just, comment that I think that that's a very good point, that it's not just about new jobs and bringing new people into the sector, but it's also how do we help those that are in different sectors make certain transitions as certain transition sector, as certain sectors transition. So I think that that's really good feedback. And I think that goes back to how do we think about who are those future employers and even the existing employers and where um, where are the skills needed and then how do we enable that? Because the reality is, is that there are going to need, there is a need for, for skilled workforce. And I think taking existing skilled workforce and being able to them move them into jobs as certain things change. But also um, I think a, a big part of the workforce strategy is really looking at how do we bring new people in as well and train them up um, that might not even have those beginning skills to begin with, because I think there will be enough jobs uh, to, to make that demand. And I, I love the comments on the sort of medium size, uh, you know, trucks and, and vehicles, I think, because that is a, we, we always think of the larger ones, but there's such a huge uh, need for that medium size well in terms of the infrastructure and charging infrastructure that's going to be needed in the future. I appreciate hearing that in the presentation as well. Any other comments? James, sure. anything you wanted to add? Oh, oh Director Gallardo has her hand. Director Gallardo, sorry. It's no problem. Thank you. Well, as a longtime fleet manager for uh, the Yellow Bus world, I, I'm thrilled to see the conversation. Um, and thinking I can throw just a little bit uh, on the jobs piece. 
one of the most important things that I know that we saw the transition um, through Elk Grove School District, we ran CNG, we had uh, passive traps, we had act active um, traps, we had propane, we had diesel. So you're going through that process and you have the, the um, diesel mechanics that can go out and wrench on your equipment, but it's changed so much. Now you also need them to be able to take the laptop out to do the diagnostics. And when we introduced electric for the first time, that's a whole nother skill set. And there truly is a crisis in finding equipment mechanics that can do all of those pieces. And quite frankly, I think if we all look at our schools, um, you'll see there are not credentialed teachers that are um, able to teach those close classes. We don't have our colleges kicking out uh, folks that have a credential in those kind of industrial arts or mechanics any longer. So it's something we need to talk about. Um, I think too, the other big piece as, as through all those different types of alternative fuels and where the hesitation comes from is even in the requirements, um, I had to do 250 of my white fleet vehicles and got them all done and everything up in order. And then that date keeps changing. Very frustrating when you have a deadline and then you see that a lot of people aren't going to make the deadline. So then they move it for another year or they move it for another year. And meanwhile, I've gone to my board and said, I have to have this done. Here's the deadline. So it's just um, that was one of the frustrating pieces. And then thrilled to, to start with our first electric buses. We started with 12, but the range um, is, a, is a huge issue. In Elk Grove School District, the, uh, it's about 320 square miles, about a third of Sacramento County, and the bus, first electric buses had a 70 mile range. Well, I don't have time to send a bus from Stockton and Florin out to Anatolia at Douglas uh, and out Jackson Highway and then get back and then be able to run again in the, in the afternoon. Um, it, it, and then that means I can't use it for a mid range. And then let's not forget, oh gosh, there's a basketball or football game tonight, but that's in Roseville. Well, that can't make it. Um, so it really, yeah, and I love that we're working on it, but I need to always remind everybody, um, I guess we won't take that field trip to the Exploratorium in San Francisco because I can't get there and there's not enough time to charge if I do. Uh, and I, I know going through that with, with compressed natural gas, you know, you'd look it up and say, oh, here's a station. And then I, you know, sure enough, I get the football team down to Fresno and oh, guess what? They're not working. And now I've got 60 kids on a school bus and I'm stuck uh, with nothing. So it's, it's really, I, I, I want us to work on it, but I want us to be very cautious and realistic that there are some, some restrictions and some limitations. SMUD was wonderful about helping us get the infrastructure in uh, because we had to upgrade um, significantly. And then exactly as you mentioned, just the facility. Now I have my place where all my plug-in buses are for traps. And then now I've got my CNG plug-ins and now I need to have my electric. I don't have any space anymore. I'm, I'm running out of physical space. So I, I'm glad to hear you're working with those folks. But I think if you're seeing a um, hesitancy to jump in, that's why at the smaller, I know for us, a smaller school district, they can't do it because they don't have the backup of extra buses. Yeah, you, you have to go with the bigger guys that can handle it to have some out of, um, that are not, are out of service. Thank you, Director Gialdo, for those really practical and real world implications when you're talking about these types of transitions. Appreciate that. Anybody else? James, any final thoughts here? Well, um, so you've heard from our partners and we're really happy to have everybody here today as well for the four agencies. You know, one of the, one of, I mean, there's so much good news in all of here, but you know, one of the challenges we have obviously is the footprint of some of our partner agencies isn't quite as big as ours, right? And so, I'm, I'm looking around the table here, um, and and but that's not to say that actually you know the air district uh, and, and Ray Porter here actually aren't working with the air districts in uh, Feather River and, and other places. But but we're aware that we need, frankly, as we've said earlier, a mega regional strategy right around some of the uh, infrastructure and the fueling and electrification. 
Um, so that's, you know, just, just understand that a lot of this uh, is a footprint right now for Sacramento County, but we th we're thinking actually even bigger across the 16 counties. Um, and yeah, there's, there'll be more to come on that as we launch our mega regional zero emission uh, vehicle infrastructure study, and I know Director Baines, that, you know, we're a lot of interest up in your district, and you have a Sutter right in the infrastructure there. Um, so I guess stay tuned on that. I just wanted to point out that we're we're still trying to work to make this a, not just six county, but a 16 county effort. Well said, James. And again, I want to thank uh, SMUD and AQMD and RT for being with us this afternoon. Uh, for giving us the update and for all the exciting work that's going on as we move forward. So thank you all. And Clint, thank you for, for jumping in as well. Okay. Uh, so we're going to go to item seven, uh, which are committee reports. And we'll go ahead and open it up to the floor uh, for anyone that like to uh, give a report. Any takers? How, Pam, how was the, uh, how was your open house on, at the museum? Oh, it, it went well. It was uh, one of uh, Donna Tolley's uh, last uh, events as um, county supervisor. So, yeah, and I was surprised with the turnout being in the middle of the day and the middle of the week. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, News 10 did a report, so yeah. Well, I plan on getting out there. I want to see it, so. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm amazed that, like, I'm sitting on that museum board. I'm amazed we even pulled it off com considering that, um, that it's, I mean, yard sales and bake sales, we're not going to do it. I'm, I'm surprised, like, you know, like a couple of agencies pitched in and, and some donations. Very good. I have a feeling that Supervisor Natoli's farewell tour might be a little bit like Elton John's farewell tour. <laughs> yes. It's going to last a while. <laughs> I agree. Anybody else? All right, seeing none. I know uh, we have two uh, receive and file items. I don't know. Staff wanted to make any uh, comments on those two items? Those are the, it's the blueprint implementation uh, and then the, the trails. Correct. Grant. So I don't know if we have anything to add to those, but um, if there are any, uh, well, one on the, just the blueprint implementation activities, um, definitely encourage, you heard from Marysville today, um, you know, SACOG does have access to grants, but we are also very willing to help your staff, you with identifying grants, applying for grants, but also we've got some some good expertise on our on our staff as well as we can connect you to other staff that are that are very well educated on a lot of these kind of strategies for advancing housing and other things around the region. So um, definitely reach out to to myself, to James, to any of us if we can be of service to your your agencies because we'd love to to highlight you in some of those receiving files or even bring you to to some of these committees so we can. Um, share what you're doing in your communities as well. Thank you. Cheers, here it goes. So um, yes. one thing just to pass along, um, I was talking to Vice Chair Kennedy yesterday and he was uh, sent his apologies uh, with uh, Director Frost. They were in a Sacramento County Board of Supervisors retreat all day. Um, we gave him some ideas about some places to visit around the region and some of you to come visit. I know he couldn't do all of you, so apologies if you haven't gotten a visit from Vice Chair Kennedy, but he just wanted to be pass along that he's really appreciated. Uh, it's really opened his eyes to see the diversity of the region and just really wants to pass his, his thanks along to all of you uh, being gracious with your time, if you've been able to see him. Um, so that's, that's, that's yeah, from the was, vice chair. He was just in, uh, in El Dorado County. Unfortunately, I was out of state on a business trip at the last minute, so, but Wendy uh, uh, met with the vice chair. And so, yes, we, we thank him for coming up and he and I are getting together in a couple of weeks uh, after that, since I wasn't able to make it uh, Tuesday, I think. So he's, uh, he's definitely making the rounds. Well, he got right. to spend a little time in Rockland last week, and we had a wonderful time, and it was great that he'd been there previously, so he already knew quite a bit. Perfect. All right, well, then uh, let's see here. It is 2.30, so I will uh, cede back to everybody a half an hour of their afternoon. Uh, I just want to thank you. This is, I guess this will be my last meeting as chair of the Lunar Committee. So I want to thank all the members and my vice chairs uh, for the help um, throughout this whole year. And again, next year, looking forward to seeing everybody in, in person, uh, hopefully uh, as we go forward here. So again, thank you. Uh, and I will talk to you all soon. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you.
Ready?